there's this massive ship. It's massive. It's one of these super um, container ships that has run aground in the Suez Canal and is... Um, <laughs> I just remember a, a, an Israeli military intelligence war story I could tell you. Do you want to hear an Israeli military... military um, <laughs> I wonder if I'd be violating any secrecy laws in Israel if I told you the story about running aground... Um, that could be interesting. I don't know who's going who's gonna to put some good super chat money on the table so that I uh, tell you some Israeli. Uh, I, I, I'm trying to think of all the details of the story. But yeah, running aground. I just just the, the Swiss Canal running aground right now, just, it just flashed in front of me this experience I had in, uh, in the Israeli army. Okay, I'll tell you that story after I tell you about, or particularly if somebody puts in a good amount on the Super Chat, I definitely will tell you. But uh, let me see if I, um, there you go, Ryan, Ryan, Ryan's put in, uh, put in 20 American dollars uh, in for that. So uh, I'll tell you. But let me start with the Suez Canal. Um, massive ship uh, ran aground the Suez Canal. The Suez Canal is, you know, it's hard to, it's hard to, you know, uh, uh, how to emphasize enough the importance of the Suez Canal to global trade. I mean, it is the major link between Asia, China, India, Singapore, uh, Taiwan, South Korea, all the industrial nations of Asia, and Europe. Basically, all the imports from China and from all those other Asian countries coming to Europe go through the Suez Canal. It's, it's so much cheaper than going around the Horn of Africa. Uh, and this is why it was built, because it, it's a massive shortcut to allow trade between Europe and Asia, which is a massive benefit to Europe and Asia. So stopping the Suez Canal is a massive um, disruption to global trade. A massive disruption to wealth creation and, and to both Asia and Europe. Uh, I don't know how much trade goes through the Suez Canal that comes to the United States because I think most of it goes through the Pacific um, to either San Francisco or Los Angeles or through the Panama Canal to the East Coast. So I don't know what the numbers are, but I assume some of the trade goes through the Suez Canal to the United States. So this is a massive disruption. But think about it. Who is responsible for the Swiss Canal? Who maintains it? Who maintains its depth, its width? Who maintains the pilot boats that pilot these massive ships through the canal? Who maintains the, the, the functioning of one of the most, maybe the most important narrow shipping lane in the world, in the entire world. Now, you say Egyptians, but who do these Egyptians actually work for? Well, the, the Egyptian government does. Scott says the UK, Audrey says the, Andrew says the UK, and neither of those are true. It's the Egyptian government. Now, I don't know how many of you know the story of the Suez Canal. But the Suez Canal was dug by the British and the French. It was drug, dug by private corporations. I think, I, I, don't, I don't have the whole history in front of me, but the late 19th century, early 20th century, when Egypt was under, uh, you know, basically British control, call it. And it was a joint French-British project, basically because it was massive, massive, um, really important for the British and the French to increase trade between Europe and Asia. So this is a 19th century project built privately by French and British businesses. And indeed, those French and British businesses ran the Suez Canal. They owned the Suez Canal. They took revenue out of the Suez Canal. 
maintained the waterway, made sure it was deep enough, made sure it was wide enough. Through 1956. And then in 1956, a military dictator of Egypt, Nasser, Nasser, N-A-A, N-A-S-A-A-R, something like that. Right? Nasser nationalized the Suez Canal. He just stole it from British and French legit corporations, businesses. The Suez Canal was private. No, it wasn't Anthony Eden who screwed it up. Because Anthony Eden, together with, I don't know who was president of France at the time, maybe it was Charles de Gaulle, actually sent troops. They parachuted troops onto the Suez Canal. They occupied both sides of the Suez Canal, drove back the Egyptian military, and basically declared that they were going to defend the private property of French and British corporations to this vital, vital national interest of both France and England. Israel at the same time, in coordination with the French and the British, invaded the Sinai, which had been a hornet's nest of terrorism, uh, supported and supplied by the Egyptians, there were crossing over the border in the Negev in the south of Israel and killing Americans. And Israel took the Sinai Desert in 1956. The Egyptians, and, sorry, the French and the British held the Swiss Canal. And I can't remember how long they stayed there, but not very long. Why? Why did they leave? Who forced them to leave? Certainly not the Egyptian military, which both Israel had whipped and the British and French had whipped. Who, I ask you on the super chat, who forced them to leave the Suez Canal, to hand it over to the Egyptian authorities, Israel to evacuate the Sinai Desert, Jimbo, Nicholas, you are right. It was the United States of America, the Eisenhower administration. President Eisenhower, oh my God, a Republican. How can this be true? I thought Republicans were pure good. Eisenhower forced them to retreat. By the way, this was a signal to Saudi Arabia and to Iran that they could go ahead and continue to nationalize American oil in those places and America would do nothing about it. So Eisenhower uh, forced everybody to back away. Israel backed out of the Suez Canal, uh, backed away from the Sinai Desert with the agreement that the United Nations would occupy the Sinai Desert and that the Egyptians were banned, outlawed, from bringing troops into the Sinai Desert that could threaten Israel. That all changed, if you just a little bit more of history, in 1967, in the spring of 1967, where Nasser, the same Nasser, ordered massive numbers of troops into the Sinai Desert and massed them on the Israeli border in spite of the barring by the Americans and by the United Nations. Uh, he told the UN to go take a hike and that's what led to the 1967 war, which is known as the Six-Day War. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Eisenhower was the establishment. Uh, who wasn't exactly the establishment? All right. All right, so... Um, oh, good, I'm seeing a bunch of you have ridden Senator Warren. Good for you. Good for you. So that was, okay, so my take on the Suez Canal is it should be French and British. It should be in private hands. 
There should be a profit motive to keeping it running well. What was Eisenhower's rationale? Good question, Richard. Richard usually doesn't ask me good questions, but this is a good question. Um, yeah, I'm sorry if I'm insulting you, Richard, but sometimes you're a pest on the, on the chat. Um, why did Eisenhower support the withdrawal, or not support, uh, basically encourage, twist the arm of the French and the British to, uh, to retreat? I wonder if anybody knows. Um, the official reason was, and I think this was the real reason, but this is what's called real politic. The reason was that Nasser was courting the Soviet Union. And the United States was afraid that Egypt would become, uh, come under the sway, under the influence of the Soviet Union. Um, Nasser was considering building a massive dam, the Anwar Dam, and was considering different companies, including American and Soviet companies, to build that dam. And Eisenhower figured that if he'd go in with Nasser on this one, Nasser would then not go in with the Soviets and become a friend of the United States. Guess what happened? Nasser said, good that you kicked out the French and the, uh, and the um, British and the Israelis. We're going to go with the Soviets anyway. And Nasser became basically a satellite of the Soviet Union. It became uh, a huge friend of the Soviet Union. The Soviets built the, uh, uh, the, the, the dam. They provided the Egyptians with massive quantities of weapons. Indeed, Egypt and the Soviet Union were buddy-buddy uh, right up to uh, the uh, early 1970s, after, uh, up until the, uh, the Yom Kippur War in 1973, after which Egypt slowly started moving away and started moving towards, um, towards the United States. And the United States started giving. And then after the uh, peace agreement between uh, Egypt and Israel, the United States started giving Egypt as many billions of dollars a year as they do to Israel. It's, and I find it interesting that people always complain about all the money Israel gets from the United States as foreign aid. What about all the money Egypt gets? So, um, oh, I forgot about my, my army story. Anyway, that's why they did it. They did it uh, as part of the Cold War, but it failed, as most of the stuff they did during the Cold War. All, most of their attempts to manipulate were all wrong and, and, uh, and distorted. What we need today, what I call the new intellectual, would be any man or woman who is willing to think, meaning any man or woman who knows that man's life must be guided by reason, by the intellect, not by feelings, wishes, whims, or mystic revelations. Any man or woman who values his life and who does not give, want to give in to today's cult of despair, cynicism, and impotence, and does not intend to give up the world to the dark ages and to the rule of the collectivist brutes. All right, before we go on, reminder, please like the show. We, we've got 163 live listeners right now, uh, 30 likes. That should be at least 100. I figure at least 100 of you actually like the show. Maybe there are like 60 of the Matthews out there who hate it. But, but at least the people who are liking it, you know, I want to see, see a thumbs up. There you go. Start liking it. I want to see that go to 100. All it takes is a click of a, a, click of a, a thing, whether you're looking at this uh, and, and, you know, the likes matter. It, it's not an issue of my ego. It's an issue of the algorithm. The more you like something, the more the algorithm likes it. So, you know, and if you don't like the show, give it a thumbs down. Let's see your actual views being reflected in the likes. But uh, if you like it, don't just sit there, help get the show promoted. Of course, you should also share and uh, you can support the show at yourrunbookshow.com slash support or on Patreon or Subscribestar or Locals 
uh, and uh, and show your support for all for, for for the work for the value hopefully you're receiving from this and uh, and of course don't forget if you're not a subscriber even if you even if you just come here to troll or even if you're here like Matthew to defend Marx uh, then uh, you should subscribe because that way you'll know when to show up you'll know what shows are on when they're on you'll get notified right so um, yes like share, subscribe, support. Like, share, subscribe, support. There you go. Easy. Do one or all of those, please.